or whatever you want to call it, of Entunet. And if your internet access is working, your bandwidth is coming from us using this gentleman's radios here. Up to my right, I've got Ron Deuce from NetX Internet, who is the CEO of NetX Internet. Uh, it's a wireless ISP out of Lorraine. I'll let Ron uh, chirp in a little bit and tell us a little bit about his organization. Sure. Um, well, Net NetX is, uh, is pretty a pretty a new ISP. Started out in uh, 2003, um, kind of bought out an older ISP, which is just doing uh, dial-ups and uh, DSL services, working with and through the uh, the ILEX. And um, because of our experiences with that, we decided to completely shift over to, to doing wireless internet access. And um, found some pretty good success in doing that and uh, getting pretty excited, pretty deep involved in wireless communications, uh, which... The so new last mile. The new last mile, and, right. and, and kind of <coughs> vlogging or jumping over the ILEX in the process, so it's been great. Excellent. And uh, on my left here is Frank Muto, who's the founder of the Washington Bureau for Internet Advocacy, is it? Right. ISP Advocacy? Right. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we had... Um, my background basically starts in 94, starting with web hosting and development. Came in ISP in 1996, grew into facility base in 97, and got my ass kicked in about 2001 with the ILEX, what, uh, losing a couple million dollars in DSL equipment and so forth when they said I couldn't do it anymore. So my goal at that point, uh, I was also running a marketing group, which I still do, which is FSM Marketing Group. My biggest key right now is helping my, my friends and my peers that are still left in the industry uh, figure out what to do with it. I mean, we've brought the internet to dial up ISPs, the mom and pops, everybody that has modem pops and Sunoco stations in the middle of Missouri, yes, they are out there, uh, like that to whatever. And we're basically getting killed as consumers and business people at ISPs out there. So the WBIA was formed uh, November of uh, 2004, and our base office is out of uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, Cynthia De Lorenzo, uh, who was from Texas, whose real aggressiveness is in the grassroots, is in Fairfax, and she walks the halls of the Brayburn Building and so far like that, trying to get ISPs and Celex uh, a little bit more voice in the industry. Uh, the biggest key, though, is it's not just us, the ISPs, it's the consumers that are out there. I don't care if it's a business or if it's your own home, if you run a Soho right now, I do a lot of my own uh, business uh, out of Soho's businesses, accountants, the tax break bill, and things of that nature, and they need high-speed assets, better than dial-up. I mean, they might not need great uplink or things of that nature, but they at least got to get some, you know, especially accountants that need to get some big files, you know, two or three megs down. So uh, we're getting hurt as consumers as well. Uh, you know, what happened right now, we're talking about uh, AT&T now. You got Verizon, and we're getting back to the Ma Bell now. Everybody calling it Papa Bell. Uh, but again, the question is, whatever happened in 1984, they called it antitrust then. Why is it not antitrust now? That actually leads into a good question. Right. Uh, by a show of hands, I mean, I know Drew used to run an ISP. Anybody else out there used to run an ISP? No? Okay, well, what about consumers? <laughs> Obviously, then we've got a consumer crowd here. Um, g generally, what... what I, I can think I can speak for everybody up here when we say that, that as ISP owners, what we try to do is we try to bring the consumers what they want. We try to give them the services that people need. If you want high speed access, if you want uh, six meg DSL, we're going to try to get it to you. If you want you know, three meg DSL or wireless or 45 meg wireless, we're going to try what we can do to give it to you. And in 19, it's, it's ironic that we're at this point in the industry where 10 years ago, in 1996, was About the telecom time. bill of 1996, which created deregulation, in quotes. Um, and deregulation allowed ISPs and independent third parties to be able to lease access to the telecommunications network that, in a lot of cases, your tax dollars have built. Every time that you pay for a phone line or every time you pay for a phone call, a certain percentage of that money goes to fund Ma Bell's management of that facility, that what we call last mile copper. And unfortunately, in the last 10 years, all of the tenements, or virtually all of the tenements of that bill, have been completely reversed and erased. So we've gone from what was essentially looked like it was going to be a good thing, we've gone to something that's, that's now, we're back to where we were 
pre-1996, and it's only taken 10 years. Now, the conspiracy theorists out there will, will, will say, well, Ma Bell's been planning this for a long time, and they just divested, and now we're back to, instead of one great large company, AT&T, we're back to now AT&T, Verizon, and, and the others. But, uh, you know, all of us up here have war stories about how mm -hmm. ILEX have unfairly competed with us in the market. You know, things like when we bring our customers, we'll call, we'll call that the help desk for the, the, the ILEC that's providing us the last mile DSL service and the first thing out of the customer service rep's mouth is, well, have you considered upgrading to AT&T 6 meg DSL product? And we're going, uh, we're an independent ISP selling your product. You're not supposed to be marketing to our customers. Um, I'm sure, Ron, Ron, you've got, you've got plenty of stories about stuff like that that's happened out in, in your territory. Care to share any? Sure, sure, absolutely. When, um, especially when we got started with uh, DSL access. Matter of fact, uh, by a show of hands, who, who uses DSL? <laughs> All right, and uh, who uses cable? All right, a little bit more than on Actually, the cable side. I use both. <laughs> One of the things that uh, we ran into is similar stories uh, that, that Greg had was um, we, we were using the ILEX DSL lines to, uh, to provide service to our, to our customers. And um, in, 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 in it kind of worked out, but when they, whenever there was a problem, um, you know, we had the ILEX calling our, our customers and telling them, hey, you know, um, your, your ISP is the problem, you need to switch to <laughs> us and um, then all your problems will be solved. And, um, and for, unfortunately, a lot of our customers listened to them because they, you know, they thought, hey, this is the telephone company, they got to be telling the truth, they got to be you know, having my best interest in mind and, and uh, they went ahead and did that and problems never got solved and, and, and we went and spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy in trying to uh, you know, help our consumers. And, at the end of the day, we got the rug pulled out from under us, and uh, those are just like one of the things that we would get, you know, from from the uh, from the ILEX. The other interesting thing is is that uh, generally, uh, I think the independent ISPs as a group have always ad advocated. Uh, uh, growth and development of the internet and, and the ability for people to really innovate. And unfortunately, the ILEX have basically squashed innovation. I mean, if you look at what's happened in the last 10 years with the internet and the growth and the fact that it's actually gone from something that was kind of neat and cool as a research institution into something that's now, you know, it, it is. It is absolutely 100% util a utility in the terms of, mm -hmm. of I mean, using it. I don't, I don't even get a paper anymore just because it's a waste of time. I go to fart for my news. But uh, I mean, it, 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 the last 10 years have been an incredible amount of innovation and that's been opened up by the fact that the Bell's networks by TA96 were opened up to competition. That competition spurred innovation or you know, spurred innovation and that innovation created a lot of the services that are out there and a lot of the interesting things. Voice over IP is an example, is right now the next biggest um, uh, thing, I guess you'd call it, on the internet. But right now, the way that you listen, you listen to Ed Whitaker and the others at the top of the iLike chain, they want to start basically rate limiting your ability to, to use the internet connection that you purchase and you pay for. So I think independent ISPs in general have been against filtering the internet unless we're actually legally required. And of course, that's where some of the, the net neutrality issues have come up uh, lately as far as uh, the competition. Frank's got a lot of great info on that. <laughs> the, the biggest thing we got to understand is consumer. Again, I'm a consumer. I'm an ex-ISP. The, the Telecommunications Bill of 1996 basically just gave us ISPs the ability to lease a specific line or to put a modem pool in our own. I started out with a hundred pair lines sitting in a basement with a bunch of modems and getting internet access to my neighborhood. That's where I started out. And then the phone company was just like, what are you doing? Okay, you gotta understand one thing. The, the telephone companies in 1984 were split up into eight different bells, okay? And then it got consolidated a little bit more. 1996 gave them all seven. That was a regularized monopoly for many, many, many years from the Telecommunication Act of 1934. Okay, none of us cared about that. You all remember, depending how old you are, things of that nature, the rotary phones as we picked up. When the TA-96 bill came, 
a lot of us techs and geeks and a lot of us out there figured out how to take that ARPANET, which was basically between schools and, and the military and things of that nature, and the dial up and the web became, Mosaic came and, and things of that nature, and all of a sudden things started rolling around. But if you would have thought about who controlled that access, it was the, the regional bell operating centers, okay? You've got three things you've got to worry about. You've got your Celix, which are your competitive local exchange carriers, which is where we had for the law. Your ILEC was an incumbent local exchange carrier. Frontier, Altel, whatever. SBC. SBC at that time. Now you've got regional bell operating companies, which are your Ma Bell, so which is your Verizons and whatever, SB, now AT&T, Bell South, Quest, well, that was kind of a pseudo. They stole somebody's stock to become a phone company and then come over you know, with it. So as consumers, we're always at their beck and call, whatever we want, okay? Um, you're forced to have, for DSL, you're forced to have, now they're starting to get away with, in fact, Verizon, anybody in Verizon territory? I can tell you a couple things. <laughs> April 10th, you're able to have DSL without a phone. Secondly, if you switch over to Verizon, kiss your copper goodbye. They're physically going to take your copper off your building. You cannot have any more copper. If you've got an alarm system, too bad. you got files, whoopie do. okay, for your internet connection. Got to remember that. But you can stop them from doing it. Technically, it's illegal. We haven't figured out how to take the FCC to court yet on that. But what Verizon is doing is right now is in your home or your building, or your, wherever you're at, they're bringing in their files, which is their, their fiber, giving you internet access, giving you a digital phone, which they're having problems with 9-11 too, but the FCC won't live up to it, uh, and the like. And they're going to pull your copper out of there. So if you have an alarm system, monitoring system, or say you have a apartment building with a couple people in there, they don't want it. They're stuck. But when they come install it, you sit there right in front of them and you tell them to leave it alone. Okay, that's just anybody with Verizon Fios right now. Right. Yes. Um, just to clarify, you, you mean when they take out the copper, they need some sort of power backup system for the spy? Let me tell you one thing. You've got an eight-hour battery system that you're going to have to worry about dealing with. And that's the whole si problem right now is Congress. Uh, Congress has no idea that technology... Uh, that's behind what's going on with the fiber and what it'll do. And you only got eight hours battery pack on there. Uh, if you're in files, if you're on the Verizon. And they're gonna send you a battery to go pick it and you're gonna do what with it? Okay, you're gonna count on that for an emergency. What's happening in the industry now, right now is, is the big two right now, AT&T and Verizon, are doing everything they possibly can and supposedly in our best interest, but are literally killing our ability for homeland security. There is the biggest problem we have right now, and the fight we're having right now, that your congressmen won't bring to you, that your senators won't bring to you, is the fact that they don't understand homeland security. The digital age is not secure. It is not going to be helpful. There is no redundancy. When you start eliminating the copper that's 100 years in the ground, that still works. Do not give up your copper. Your files, that battery goes down, kiss it goodbye. Okay, when the power goes out, you still got a ring a ding ding on your little copper phone. Always keep one available. Ice pen right now. I came from Illinois and, and, and now in Ohio. I'll spend the twelve dollars a month to have that little princess phone sitting in the corner. I will never ever give up a tried and true copper. Never, never will. You know, as far as yeah. What's that? Forty one dollars a month. Uh, no, they're, they're stealing it from you. They're stealing it from you. You can get a basic phone for about 12 to $13 plus taxes. You have to argue with them. The, the first time it's you there. say it's not available, yeah. and you just, just ask to speak to a manager. It's right there on their website. You can go right to their website and order it. It's a little, it's buried, but you can find it. You can find it. It's not, it's not an advertised Okay. Well, I'm an SBC AT&T affiliate, and I sell their new Direct Connect as far as their, what they call their web partner program. I do roughly about somewhere between two to 3,000 of those sales a month. People are calling me up, how do I get this cheap thing? Well, it's, you can just go here, 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 and we show them how to do it, put in my affiliate link, I make 10 bucks, and off they go. Okay. But the problem is, it is there. But SBC is not going to tell, or AT&T is not going to tell you it's there. Okay, it's part of the lifeline circuit. Okay, it's part of the lifeline circuit. And if you really want to cheat, just if your grandmother's living with you, your mom and dad, and they're over 50 years old, pfft, you got it. There you go. They got to have a lifeline. There's nothing they can do about it. It's got to be there. They haven't stolen that away yet, but it's got to be there. 
you know, as far as that's concerned. But the key for consumers is when's the last time you heard, you, you've got all our, you know, and I'm not coming down on Congress, I'm not coming down on what's going on, but the problem is they think they know what's good for us consumers, okay? When's the last time you got a letter or a phone call or anything from a congressman or senator and says, hey, we're talking about the telephones, internet, access. We would like to have your input. Who's ever been asked their input about what's going to happen here? Okay, but you voted, we voted for these people to be in. Okay, I'm going to bring my political attitude in here in a second. We have voted these people in for other reasons. But in the meantime, you've got, and I come from Illinois, we've got Mr. Old Bobby Rush who, who, who really gets my goat sometimes. He puts all these names on these. You know why? It's all the political, it's the political action committees, it's all the money that's tied into it. Okay. Since, and I'm not going to, again, it's a political thing, but since 2000, three things that have happened. Pharmaceuticals, petroleum, telecommunication. The three biggest major monopolies and winners for what reason? Who were the three biggest contributors in 2000 for the Bush campaign? I didn't meant to mention his name, but their current administration is. Petroleum's doing what in billions of dollars and flooding in your face? Government doing anything about it? No. Telecommunications. There's no more competition. We're, we're losing it. That's going right back to where? The big three. And pharmaceuticals. So you look at those three things and, and what's kind of going on. It's really going to be us consumers to finally say something about it. Yeah, you can vote. You can vote them out. By the time it happens, it happens. But vote with your feet? You can vote with your feet, but you can also talk to them now. You can go to congress.org look up your senator house representative state and federal and tell them what you don't like three things that happen on the hill it takes seven individual people to get someone's attention but it does not take a lot believe me seven individual people with the same problem will get the aid now your senator and congressman don't do anything other than with the committee that they're on if there are specific committees like the House Commerce Committee or House Meetings and Ways, they only have to worry about zoning on that. But they got to vote on all those other bills. Do you think they're smart enough to understand all of that stuff? Heck no. They got all their aid. So in each office, there's an aid for telecommunication, one for medicine, one for whatever, whatever, whatever. So you want to get a hold of those people and what's kind of going on. If you have a problem with your phone system, the hot seat right now is telecommunications and internet, and I'll get right back to the network neutrality. We're going to be screwed here in roughly about 60 days. If SBC gets a hold of Bell South, and we're supposed to know something within the next 60 days, to some of the things that I know about is because what we do with the WBA out of Washington, we get to learn what's happening going on in there. If they let this merger go through, we're going to have hard times. We're going to be right back to 84 again, and they're going to be able to control a lot of things that we do with the Internet. You know, it's supposed to be free. We're supposed to be able to do what we want with it. We're paying for the service. Now, here's the problem. If you like Google, if you like Amazon, if you like any other major so-called content providers, you're paying for the service for your cable or your what? DSL, whatever the case may be. You're paying for that bandwidth. So is Google. And me, a website owner, I have somewhere about 35 or 40 somewhere websites out there, I lose count. But I provide services to people. They come to my website and they'll pull files down and what have you. Well, what's going to happen to Googles and the Amazons and whatever, AT&T, Verizon, and Bell South, and our are going to go, you know what? We want a piece of that action now again. Well, Ed Whitaker has gone as far as to call the people, his consumers, the people that are paying Ed Whitaker's salary, and Ed Whitaker is the CEO of AT&T mm -hmm. at this point, has gone as far to call you, the consumers, parasites. Parasites. You are parasites on his network. It's his network. It's not, you didn't build it, okay? Between the years of 1998 and 2004, you know, <coughs> ISPs were responsible for 60% of AT&T's build out, oh. okay? 60%. You guys wouldn't have the resources that you have at your disposal if ISPs hadn't gotten together and actually delivered that. And now you're parasites because you're on their network and you're using it and you're not paying him for every bit, bit that you send across it. Right. And Yahoo and Google are the freeloaders. Okay. So it's not like. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Despite the fact that Yahoo and Google have gone to great lengths to place caches of their information at strategic points in the internet to reduce the total bandwidth. 
Like for example, with Cox Cable, as a cable provider. Now, I don't like any particular large-scale provider, but Cox and Google have gotten together, and Google has a significant amount of resources that are actually located on Cox's network that are mirrors of its data, so that it can be more friendly, Google searches on these networks can be more friendly to the general internet as a whole. I mean, you don't want 8 million subscribers out there all going to the same website if you can basically load all that content into their data center and keep it fresh, you, you, it's the same thing as caching. So, so again, AT&T and, and, and the, big, the big companies here are, are going to basically try to charge you to access other people's content. Well, that's the, the problem is, though, you got Yahoo's and the Goo's and so forth. Everybody thinks they get kind of antiquity for free. Well, that's what the Whitakers of the world are trying to make the consumers think. They pay for their bandwidth, whether it's a T1 to OC92, whatever the case may be, over hundreds and hundreds of millions of miles worth of copper and fiber that's out there. They're paying for that transport. But now what they're trying to do is say, oh, we want a piece of the action, okay? Uh, especially in, in, in Meritech land and where I grew up in Illinois and Ohio here and things of that nature, you got Project Lightspeed, okay? When SBC, when SBC took over Ameritech, when SBC took over Ameritech in Illinois, they had promised they were going to bring out the fiber and get the equipment and things of that nature. What they did, basically, what SBC did was lie to the Congress and lie to the FCC. They went out to Lucent and, and leased hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars worth of equipment, put them in the CEOs, had the auditors come out and look and say, yep, yeah, looks like you guys are going to build it. We're going to give you your what? We're going to give you your merger. Within 30 days after a merger, Lucent and UPS and things of that nature were pulling that equipment out of the CEOs. I lived two and a half miles away from one in Geneva, Illinois. I was going past one day and saw not one or two, but 15 55-foot trailers lined up, pulling off boxes and, bo I mean, freshly, I mean, still got the wrapper on it from Lucent. So I called my buddy who was a lab rat for Lucent, started with Bell Labs, actually was the CTO of my company, and said, what are you guys doing with all this equipment? He goes, well, that's the stuff we lease. We don't need it anymore now that we got the merger. And this, by the way, this stuff is just not stuff that we're saying. Mm -hmm. You can go out on net and find it. There's a there's yep. a guy that we invited that couldn't make it. Uh, can't, what the hell's his name? David something or other. Um, Eisenberg. No, not mm -hmm. Eisenberg. It's the other guy that always complains that he doesn't make enough money to go, go anywhere. Uh, but he's got a he's got a, an ebook out there called the twenty million twenty billion dollars. Oh, Bruce Kushnick. Bruce Kushnick. Bruce Kushnick. Bruce Kushnick. And I, he's the, the gentleman is kind of really kind of interesting. He's an ex bell head. Did a lot of um, <coughs> consulting for them and so forth like that. He's basically started doing auditing of phone bills. Okay. And what I think is kind of funny, when I look at about 26% of my cell phone bill is in taxes and federal regulations, and where half of that is not even mandated by the government, or even they're supposed to pay it. It's just one of those things they just kind of add on. But if you've got 26 million customers, for example, and you add a nickel, do you see a nickel on your phone bill because it regulates every month? If you're paying by the minute or a flat rate, you don't see a nickel. 26 million people times a nickel, I am not that good in math, but I know that's a hell of a lot of money. Okay. Well, you know, All right. So you kind of look at what we've been getting, talking about. You're hearing about universal service fees. Anybody understand what universal service fund is supposed to do besides make CLEX a lot of money? Oh, there's a, actually a couple. Um, that's $1.3 million a month, by the way. Damn, that's, that's uh, okay. It's, it's unbelievable, but one of the, that USF... Universal, yeah, service fund, right. Well, what that, what that is is basically uh, a fund that's supposed to be uh, for the ILEX to pay for rural access. Right, uh, like access Poughkeepsie, to, Iowa. Right, you know, places that are, you know, far out, not the cities. If you're in the suburb, suburbs or you're somewhere outside of the suburbs, you don't get subpar copper or subpar telephone service because you're way out in the, the boondocks. Right. So they're, they're supposed to get the, you know, that, that's money set aside that they're supposed to collect from your bill that you get every day. And it's on long distance. It's really just on your long distance interstate type of phone bill. So it really doesn't add up to a lot, but it does it for millions and millions of people. But the problem is, it's a system that's broken. Uh, I could probably go look it up on the internet again, whatever, but about a year and a half ago, there was a, uh, the RICO Act was established on a, uh, a CELIC in Kansas that he was making more money on USF fees than he was selling phones. He had 4,000 lines, was making $1,400 a month just on the service fees. Your fees are based on how hard it is for you to supply local phone services to everybody in that area. So we've got a very broken system, and we've got to figure out as consumers 
how to get it back from them. Yes. I, I live in a um, rather prominent uh, suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and there are people just two doors down that just cannot get DSL. And like, is there any way that us as consumers just can call them on this ISF because they're just completely dropping the ball? But see, that, that's not really, it's not it's supposed to be for that. It's supposed to be for more for rural to help the high build out. You know, if you've got a, a county where you got thousands of, you know, you know, you only got 60 or 50 homes, okay, not, you're not bunched up. And it's really just the cost of build out. Plus, it was supposed to help for schools and libraries and whatever. <laughs> when it comes to that particular problem right there, I can, if it's in a Verizon territory, I can guarantee it's because the local plant has now switched over from copper to fiber. And, and what the bells have done is actually held us hostage as consumers. And they basically went, and it's in the paper, they basically went to Congress and said, listen, get rid of these ISPs or we're not going to bring out broadband. Because of the administration said, everybody's supposed to have broadband by 2007. Well, we know that was just something for to get votes, and it was just a big thing to use in 2000. Because that was the real, high. that was when dial-up was starting to, starting to do a little bit of a peaking and things of that nature and, and come down. So that was just a, you know, a catchphrase at that time. Everybody's going to have broadband by 2007. Don't think so. It's not going to happen. Well, I know that's bull because there is a, another rural county that lives that's right next to us. And I used to have people come to me all the time and say, why can't I get DSL? Why can't I get this? And, and I actually, I called up a buddy of mine that worked in the county recorder's office and I said, hey, when was the last time a bill for me was issued by the telco you know, to actually string, you know, uh, you know, wire on the poles. 1956. They're not mandated to use the money, but let's put it this way. Let me tell They're you something. To they they are, it's not even like they've had any recent bill permits. They don't have to. There's nothing in the law. There's nothing in the law. They get the money. And they hold on to it. They hold on to it. And they make interest on it. Actually, they, 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 they actually use that money for, for internal operations. Well, yeah, for GSA. But that's not the point. You're, you're absolutely right. We can, we can come up. We did that in Wisconsin. We did it in rural Iowa. We did it in rural Illinois. Went right to the local C, uh, ILX and things of that nature. Frontier citizens. <laughs> big, big pain in the ass when it comes to that. They get millions of dollars a year to bring to upgrade rural communities. Okay, we've got pictures and things of that nature where we, they've got, you know, they're taking tape and, and putting things together and things of that nature, and they, but they get hundreds of millions of dollars to replace that line, okay? We've seen them take old line. If they have to replace a copper line, which was in Illinois and Iowa. Or the pair swapping game. They'll, yeah, well, they'll go, to another, they'll go to another line and take some off. They'll take whatever they got off the truck to patch it in and things of that nature. Instead of taking the millions of dollars that they were given, as far as the general fund, to string a new line I've had to make it work. I've had text tell me that. They said they fully admitted to me in rural areas. Yeah. They will go and swap a pair. Customer B on one side of the street, bitches moans and complaints are getting static. Yeah. Guess what? They're not going to replace that whole string of cable. They flip, they get up on the pole, they flip the pair. Mm -hmm. the customer B on the exact opposite side of the street. Now he's got problems. Right. Static. Well, see, let me tell you. See, that's job security. <laughs> see, I'm sorry but to tell you, but that's job security. <laughs> That's job security for the tech. Okay, that there, it was easier to do that. So consumers, the biggest thing I think we're talking about as far as what we're here talking about today is the consumers have really got to start saying something. And then most of us has got the ability to get on the net. They Let's put it this way. Do not mail anything because of 9-11. It takes seven to eight weeks to get mail. Internet, email, fax. They will get the attention of facts. It takes seven people to get the AIDS attention to get on, hey, something's wrong list. Anything more than that makes a big difference. So we want to talk about how we can help us as consumers. We're all consumers here too, not just business people. We're consumers. Yes. I mean, you get stuck in one of those games because I've actually been in it. I've spent yeah. to get DSL working. I didn't even have phone service for a while. It was even usable. I spent literally 150 plus hours on the phone. I had a log of all of it on the phone with SBC. And I live in the major metropolitan area, in the Indianapolis metro area, actually in city limits. And it took that long talking to these people. And the previous owner had phone service that worked. And when I moved in, they'd swap the pair out, and there was a dial tone on the pair that ran into my building all of a sudden. What do you do? How do you get around that without getting caught in that bureaucracy? Because I know I'm not the only one. You know, we've got two people sitting here in this room. If you think about the percentage of people having problems just sitting in this room, multiply that by millions of people out there. You know what? And we're not saying anything. 
about it. Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing. You spent 150 hours on the phone with SBC and eventually maybe got working service. If you would have taken 15 minutes and had you and your friends, five other friends, write something to your congressman and the PUCO, or where, are you from, if you're from Ohio, the PUCO, yeah. whatever your, your, your utilities commission, you gotta speak up. I log every conversation that I have with SBC. I've got millions and millions and millions of lines of text of, of conversations that I've had with SBC. Well, a bunch of the state of the I actually did complain regulatory commission in the I can't remember what the name of it is. And the result was they smacked with a $100,000 fine. Yeah, well, and, and this so is... There, there's a okay, that was an hour and a half worth of retail. Yeah, okay, that's not a big deal. That's the key. That's a point. That's a great point. We bring that up all the time on the Hill. Yeah, they have more money. SBC, if, if you listen to SBC's lobbyists, in Congress and, and, and in the Hill, you will hear them crying that we cannot make any money. It takes so much for us to maintain this legacy copper infrastructure. We can't make any money. Yet they're setting aside $200 million a year specifically to pay Lobby. legal costs and fees that they know that they're going, they're going to break the laws and they know they're going to have to pay these, these, these fines and they will knowingly go ahead and do that. The pair swapping game, we get that all the time. We get people that come in, we go into a building, there's, there's five or six people that have DSL in the building, and all of a sudden you got some idiot tech in there with a butt set going, oh, I don't hear anything on this line, there's no dial tone, and they'll go ahead and just take the pair. I mean, it, it's, it, it's, it's absolutely ludicrous. I mean, I, I can tell you alone that in my building, we refuse to sell SBC services in our building anymore. I am upstairs from a CLEC. I'm, I'm upstairs two floors above XO that has a central office downstairs for me. There's no way in hell if I can go onto an OC192 that's in a 911 facility that I'm going to go and use 1947 paraffin wrapped cable from SBC to deliver services to my, cu my customers. And when I called SBC, 57 hours on the phone saying, we would like you to replace the riser cable. They said, ah, well, when the new building owner took over, you, it was his responsibility. It's not our responsibility anymore. Yeah, but it's your DMARC. Well, it's not our responsibility. It's riser cable. Yeah, but it's your DMARC. It's your boxes in our facility. Ah, we don't care. Okay, screw off. That's essentially what they pretty much tell us. They tell us, go away. So as a result, we've basically moved all of our customers off of SBC facilities. We have two, two SBC T1s that come into our facility, and the other 50 or 60 are XO, and there's a bunch of others that are ICG and, and WorldCom. We refuse to sell services on SBC's network unless we absolutely have no choice, which with DSL we do. So um, I mean, I, I, one of the things that, that is sort of getting off topic here, again, ranting a bit, one of the things that, that I, that I told, it, told uh, Froggy that I would talk about is, is how ludicrous it is to expect that any independent ISP could ever make dollar one selling DSL through the carrier's networks, okay? Now, with dial-up, you had the opportunity to buy lines and under the Fax Act or whatever that was, which they're trying to take away so you can't make data calls on your phone line anymore. Yes, call a computer too. Yeah. Under that scenario, we were able to basically have a ratio of dial-up lines, 10 to 1, 15 to 1, 20 to 1 if we're selling really cheap internet access, and we would allow consumers to dial in and access the internet. Very set line lines, okay? When we do DSL, you've got to be less than 20,000 feet from the central office, depending, well, with the old technology. With new technology, maybe 30,000 feet if they really want to push it. Well, so that means that the Bells have to actually build out facilities into manholes and these little, these little bunkers on people's lawns where they're putting D-slams to consolidate within a 30,000 square foot radius to provide DSL. Granted, that takes money to build out, but you're already paying for that in your, your taxes for your phone bill. So, of course, they cry and did the whole thing with Lucent, and they said, we're going to deliver broadband everywhere. They, they, they claimed that by 2006, they would have 98% of SBC's market covered with DSL. You know what the penetration is now? Anybody have a guess? 30, 40, 20, 10, 10, 17. Keep going. Two. Last I heard was 6%. Oh, my God. 6%. They've got 20, I've got a database when I was doing DSL as a wholesale wet SBC. They gave me a database with 27 million eligible lines for their higher speed DSL. Not just their bumper crop, but their higher speed. 27 million lines. As of last quarter, they only have 6.5 million lines sold out of 27 million. 
So after six years? After, yeah, after six years. Okay. okay. So how do you deregulate that instead of... Well, we're not really deregulating. We're still regulating, but it's kind of a lazy affair. We're just keeping our hands off because... And at that point, the only, the only solution is a stringer on damn copper. Well, that, that brings up oh, a very I interesting conversation. Are you, you're talking about... Okay, everybody's hearing about the Muni Acts. Everybody's talking about municipalities. Why are you getting in the game? Because they can't get SBC off their butt, Verizon off their butt to do anything. But in the meantime, if your town, like your local town, would like to get their own municipality, pull in a line, and start using their own rights away... I'll be damned if SBC, Verizon, or Quest, or Bell South, they're sitting there with their lawyers saying, screw you, you can't have it, we're going to yeah. take you to court, they, and we're going to beat you down. They've actually gone, gone and in several states made it illegal. They've mm -hmm. been able to get laws passed that make it illegal for a municipality mm -hmm. to run its own telecommunications infrastructure. Kentucky. Indiana. And, and, and I think they've done that statewide in at least three, um, three or four states already have laws on the books to, that says these municipalities cannot start their own network. You know, but the bottom line is the telephone companies don't li care about the internet. That doesn't make any money. They don't know how to make money on it. If they did, I as an ISP wouldn't have been around. I was using their infrastructure. They could have just given dial-up away between 1996 and 2002. They could have gave dial-up away and killed all of us. I wouldn't have had 52,000 end users. I wouldn't have been a pretty mid-level ISP. But they didn't want it. They didn't want it. All they cared about is when the 96 Bill Act was enacted and they lost long distance, everything was split up, there was the intrinsic thing that was going on that they knew they had sunsets built into it. If you had a chance to read, it's about 348 pages long. If you had a chance to read it, which I have somewhere about 40 or 45 times already, um, and that's just over the last year. There was sunsets built into that law in the, in the 96 bill. It looked great on paper, and it still works. Only if the FCC, the Federal Communication Company, would have done their job in doing enforcement of it. Okay? And we stood as consumers. Again, we're sitting up here as consumers. We're, what we're, my goal is with the WBIA is with ISPs, I've, for five years, I've been trying to wake them up. But the problem with some of my friends and peers in it is they're kind of idiots, okay? Yeah. And, I, and I tell it to my dirty face. I don't cut anything long. But they're afraid to tell you, the consumer, that they're in trouble. But if you knew your favorite, who hates to switch I, e email addresses? Who hates it? 99.8%. I'm in the marketing business. And I'll tell you one thing. When, when I gave up my ISP because uh, of a partner and some legal issues, things of that nature, I had 52,000 end users, 350,000 mailboxes. I gave my P, and I had two of my suppliers go underneath because they went out of, uh, went of business. But I gave, I gave up the dial-up business. I gave my people 90 days. Guys, I can't do this anymore. We can't, we can't bring you to DSL. Uh, we got people going belly under, left and right. We got the DomCon crash. You know what the number one thing is? What do I do with my email? I've been with you for four years. I says for tw ten dollars a year, I'll keep it on my box. And that's what I did. You know, I've got two or three boxes sitting in Fayetteville, Carolina, is doing I don't know, 160, 170 thousand email boxes. Only about ten percent of them are being used. But damn it, they got their email. They did. They didn't lose it. They had it. They didn't want to go to SBC. I, mean, I do an affiliate. I run a, a company that they outsource me as their CFO, secretary, treasurer. I run data operations. We do affiliate marketing. We people call us all day long. It's, oh yeah, we'd like to get the SPC DSL, but why do I have to get their email? Email is the killer app. Email is the thing that people hate to change. You know, as far as as far as that's concerned. So we have to look at what we're losing because you know what? All they want they're going after the cable companies now. The box are going after the cable companies. And now they want a piece of the TV action. It's not going to happen. The, the, cap well, they, they, the they, they, cable companies have got 30 years on it, the TV people. They want to be, um, they, want, they, they want everything out of the internet now. Now that they see that, hey, people are actually using this, this internet. Yeah. And, um, you know, we want all, all, all sorts of action. Well, you mentioned email, Amber. So I've already talked right about my complaint, about exactly what you're talking about. I recently switched ISPs. And my new ISP thought I was insane not to want to just use their email, you know, use my existing email account. There, you know, and, and I've talked a bit about reasons for the ISP blocking various traffic things like that, which I understand. As guys running ISPs, what what is your perspective on well, my issue? Was I already have my own email? I want to be able to send SMTP 
over standard ports to that server. Mm -hmm. I understood the filtering reasons for that. Should I, as a consumer, it's somebody, and I read through every last bit of any documentation that they had as far as what I agreed to with my service, which incidentally, I found a whole contract on their website that supposedly I agreed to, but I never signed. They never presented it to me when they came and hooked up my cable or at any other point. Use of the system. Yes. Use of the system. Use of the system. Um, but basically, do I have, I mean, when I, when I got them on the phone, they basically told me, we have no requirement to tell you what ports we're blocking, you know, the or to unblock them, there's unless you give us a bucket of money for a static IP. Wait, there's no... Money for more. Th that this, that's this the net neutrality. Is exactly, this is the net neutrality issue. Right. This is the issue that is right now the big hot button and what we're discussing. The issue being that nobody, I mean, look, I have resisted as an ISP, I have resisted blocking ports for my consumers as much as possible. But I have ha basically spam and virus and malware has forced me to be into the position where I have to block outbound SMTP for certain blocks of, of users. Okay, grandma sitting in rural Ravenna does not understand that the porno message she just downloaded and clicked on just put, is now sending out six million messages an hour through mail servers. I understand the default denied policy, but my complaint is should I not as a consumer, I feel like I bought a pipe. Well, I would advocate that your position is correct, that they should let you know this is what you're not allowed to do on our service. However, their position is you're a parasite on our network and we want to charge you more for business class services. This net neutrality issue and the fact that you're going to start now, if you want advanced services, you're going to have to pay for them. Well, and, and, and you know, that's that's one problem. You have one particular, you know, instance of a problem service where you're talking about your email, but um, some people actually use a voice over IP, uh, Vonage services, um, it's pretty big. And in that same, in that same, a same example is what they're saying is, hey, we don't promise that what you got on the internet should work. You know, we basically, if you want that to work the way you want it to work, uh, for whatever reason, then you know you pay, um, pay more. What is what is true when you get into the tier internet? Yeah. Just the nature of packet switching. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Let's and, let's yeah. And, let's. There are definitely issues with delivery of of voice over IP over the public internet. You're not going to get anybody up here telling you that it's but, that and, it's not. And, and, but and, and, yeah, intentionally screwing around with your packets, introducing jitter and delay, and mm -hmm. basically blocking specific ports. I, I mean, there was just a. a I've heard of that. I've heard like like some co cable companies want to run their own VoIP service, sure. and they want to start blocking. There you go. Absolutely. Uh, now, if they're up front, if they're up front and telling you that, then you, you as a consumer yeah. say yes or no. It's when they don't tell you where it's not fair, or it's buried so far deep, deep in the into information, it. as Chris has pointed. Acceptable out. use policies. If you go to any kind of service policies, you got to look at terms of service, acceptable use policies. And they're starting to bury it in the ever familiar privacy policy. Right. You'd be surprised how much stuff is stuck in the policy. Okay. Type, type of stuff. Like stuff uh, th well, the, 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 it's like uh, TOS bits for your uh, your quality of service. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no guarantee that your ISP has to forward those on. Right. But Comcast specifically, I believe, was b was was basically dropping those and changing them around uh, so that they, you know they would basically right yeah I mean well <laughs> look there's a bunch of there's a bunch of issues going on right now and, and Vonage for for all of the innovation that they've done as far as bringing VoIP to the consumer level I think is a dead man walking because voice over the public internet it's really not that great of an idea if you need to rely on it it works most of the time, but you can't guarantee. I mean, when you have a circuit switch network like the PSTN, you know point A to point B, you are going to get 64 kilobits of data, and it's going to be guaranteed, and there's no other contention for any other service on that line. Once you get out onto Cox's network or Comcast network or Cogent's network or any of the other networks, 
they, you're, you're basically at, at, at a packet switch network. There's no guarantee that one packet isn't going to take 30 seconds to go halfway across the universe and back to get to your neighbor, and then the next packet will go right there from their router. I mean, there is no control over that with TCP IP. So voice over IP, this is, gets into a whole other discussion, but voice over IP, I believe, is inherently a very good thing. It's a great thing for consumers. Voice over the public internet is not such a great thing. So we're down to about three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes. All right. Okay. So, questions. Uh, is it? Have you guys thought about doing things like cutting the AT and T out and just like get a T one or whatever between your ISP and his ISP? Public peering. There was somebody that had a basic that did a talk here today about about building, or it was yesterday, I believe, yeah. about yeah. building metro metro peering points. Yeah. We are we try to do, I try to do that with as many ISPs as I can. I mean, we're we're in the process of setting up a hundred megabit peering point just for our customer bases. Um, but the problem is, is that, uh, as, as Frank pointed out, a lot of ISPs are just, they're so, they've got blinders on. You know, the ISPs could go to their customer bases and have a machine to go to Congress and take it to their senators, but people don't want to send a message out saying, hey, we need your help, because it makes them look more incompetent than they already are, I guess is to say. I mean, no. it, as internet, do you send out, like, Mailings Every now and then, when we have a really important issue, we try to do that, yeah. I mean, there's still 30 million people out there still up on dial-up, and there are new ones up every day. The internet itself, the public internet, was a best effort as best. So we basically the, took a, a system that wasn't designed to be doing what it did, but you know what? It made a lot of millionaires, billionaires. There has been nothing in this country's history in a 10-year period, actually in a five-year period, that took the economy Oh, to where it was. And you're talking about a U.S. economy. And they got spread across to the rest of the world. Right. Everybody keeps talking about, and I don't want to make too long, how about what Asia's doing in Japan and China, whatever. Think about this one second. We got a hundred plus years of copper here that the Bells are making money off of. Europe, Asia, Japan got bombed the hell out of. Guess what you're going to put back? Fiber. You're not going to put copper back in. You might as well throw the fiber. And they're clustered much closer than we have in the United States. Right. Totally different bigger markets. So when you talk about the United States falling behind in broadband, no, we're not. Technically, we have the highest penetration of broadband right. per capita than, yeah, it still is. Korea. Huh? Korea yeah, but it's so much easier when you got them stacked, racked, and packed, and multiplied right. into that nature versus the United States, whatever the case may be. But we st it's still something that we have to fight for. All right. We got to wrap it up. I, I, I apologize. We don't have more time. I'm available for questions after. Mm -hmm. uh, you can always find me in the bar for a beer. I'd be happy <laughs> to have a conversation with you over beer. Uh, I wanted to thank everybody. That there was one question. If you didn't get your questions asked now when we're breaking down here, feel, feel free to come up and ask me. I, I'm sure Ron and, and uh, Frank uh, are the same way. I wanted to thank you guys for participating, and uh, hopefully we uh, provided some valuable information for you. Thank you very much. Uh, I put have a, a sad note for you all. Um, we've had three cars broken into in the lot, parking garage. Um, I'm taking steps right now to pull out my credit card and get a security guard to monitor that for you guys so no other cars are broken into. Identify which uh, we have identified which three they are. So far, uh, they've all filed police reports and gotten it fixed, but I just thought I'd let you folks know, and I'm not going to let you down. And if you want to help, help the cause, let me know. <laughs> all right. Thanks a lot, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Great talk. No problem. Thank right. you. Yeah. Hi there. How you doing? I work for a municipal ISP in mm -hmm. Richmond, Indiana. Oh, Richmond. Okay. And uh, part of Richmond. Very good. And you said... Good. Useful? Uh, help? Yeah. Good stuff, yeah. You had a question. I'm yeah. sorry. Uh, so, Nick DSL. Um, mm -hmm. You talked like about... Over. You know, pulling They've up already pulled that out of the last yeah. mile or replacing okay. it with fiber. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But what I'm yeah. seeing yeah. is uh, where they're really the putting the money, the money is in the, the towers. That's great. Right. And there's a lot more effort. Yeah. And yeah. What yeah. Talk about yeah. building yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what they're building out. There's a difference. So where are you pulling out proper and putting in They don't seem to be doing 